Courage to do the things of God is found in the Holy Word, the Bible. And as God said in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night. And then in verse 9, God said, Be strong and of good courage, and neither should you be dismayed or afraid. Join us now for Fuel for Courage in our Bible study hour. Good evening. Welcome to our Tuesday night Bible study. Thanking God for your participation with us in this study. I am a church member. A uh, small little book, and I, and I said in the beginning, it's available on Amazon. Uh, I, I know some people have already told me they went out, got the book. Very beneficial. There are other studies up. A uh, number of churches have done this as a Bible study. We're thankful, though. We're approaching it in the Christ Baptist way, and we thank you for joining with us. Let's open in prayer. Eternal God, we thank you, Lord, again tonight for our study. We thank you for guiding us from last week to this week. So much has occurred in the, since the last time we were together, and things are going on all over the world, and there are explosions and storms and tropical storms, and all kinds of things are happening, and yet you're still the God that sits on the circle of the earth. You're still the God that rules and reigns in the lives of men. And we come, God, learning, purposing to learn more about you. We come purposing to grow in a knowledge of you and your son. And by that, Lord, have a better relationship. Through that relationship, able to share it with others. That they too can become a part of the called out ones, the ecclesia, your body in this world. Bless us now in our time of study. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson tonight, we're journeying further into this study. I am a church member, made up of a lot of different people. And tonight we're going to study on, I will lead my family to be healthy church members. I want to say from the beginning that everything that grows is not healthy. Uh, a tumor grows and is not healthy. We're talking about healthy church growth and what it takes for us to become a healthy body. And as we, God is sending people to us, they will enjoy the benefits of that health. Rainer writes, his name was Bob. He died a few years ago. But if he influenced just a few people like he influenced me, this relatively unknown and quiet man changed the world. Bob always seemed to be at the church. I understand that some people show up at church every time the doors are open out of guilt or legalistic obligation. Not Bob. He was always joyous, always serving, always kind. You could just tell he loved serving the church. The same could be said about Bob's wife and two sons. They too seemed to love the church and to find joy in serving. The whole family was, well, different, but different in a good kind of way, if you know what I mean. I was a young businessman in my early 20s. I had been married for three years and had just become a dad. Fatherhood hit me like a ton of bricks. I wanted to be a good husband and a good dad, and that meant getting involved in church, really involved. I didn't know it at the time, but Bob was watching me. He was concerned for me. He loved my youthful enthusiasm, but he knew what was coming. The more I got involved, the more I would see the imperfections of the church, the minister, the elders, the staff, and other church members. That last statement, the last line of that second paragraph is the one that, that really starts to hone in on some things that happens in church. The more I got involved, the more I would see the imperfections of the church, the minister, the elders, the staff, and other church members. It is so easy to see the imperfection in other people while neglecting or even justifying our own weaknesses and shortcomings. Uh, the, the Bible delves into this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Jesus says, And why? Beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. I mean, what a great passage. Jesus says, you're talking about the splinter that's in somebody else's eye when you got a telephone pole sticking out your head. How can you help them with the splinter, the small thing that's in their eye, when you got this large thing that's looming over your life? He says you're a hypocrite. First you need to get it out of your own. Get your own self ready. Get your own self right before you're able to help other people. It is 
Is it possible to focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the flaws of our own? We said it's possible. People do it all the time. That's why Jesus made the comment that he made. Is it practical to think that we can say to a friend, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of so much more? Beloved, there's something about leadership in the church is that people want us to be exemplary leaders in all things. People want us to lead in relationships. They want us to lead in giving. They want us to lead in worship. They want us to lead. They want to look to an example to follow. And they want to see that there's someone that I can model, I can pattern my life after if I'm going to be involved in this ministry. Both the behaviors makes the judgmental one to be a hypocrite. For one should first know their own blind spots. We got to know our own shortcomings, our own failings. We got to deal with them before we try and deal with the blind spots that are in other people's eyes, in other people's lives. Now, if we're honest, we were all taught that the great truth by either our parents, or our grandparents, or our brothers, sister, pastors, Sunday school teachers, we were all taught a great truth. And from this truth, there are other observations that I'd like to raise. This truth that you first got to get yourself right, get the mode out of your own eye. We were taught that before. There is a biblical correlation between the church and the family. That's why the church is made up of families, but there's a correlation. What goes on in the family is also a lot of things that happen right at the church. We're taught in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. Wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, the, the, the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. I know sometimes we read passages in the Bible and we have our own thoughts about things and certain passages we read and it strikes us and we want to take out our sharpie and we want to cross those passages out because they don't agree with what I'm saying. Let's go through this again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Submit, huptaso, it's a military term. Place yourself in rank under your husband. That's what the Bible says. I don't like that. I, we're equals. I'm by his side. I'm his, I'm, he, I came out of his side. I'm walking by his side. I love it. I love all of that. The Bible says, submit yourselves. And submit yourselves has nothing to do with physical posture, but submit yourself has to do with mental posture. What do you, where do you place yourself against the one that God has put in your life as a husband? The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, wives, be subject unto your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. Whoa, time out, stop. Didn't he die for the church? I'm to love my wife. I'm to give my life for her. Love husbands. Listen, I know what you're thinking. I know what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's why husbands, very important. How you talk to her is very important because the words that you speak and the manner you speak them are you speaking like Christ. We, we, there's a biblical correlation between the church and the family. Paul would then make clear the relationship between the church and the family, verse 32 to 33. The biblical text continues in Ephesians 6. But this time, the subject is how parents are to deal with their children. We are to raise them in a fear, reverence, and admonition, correction, and love of the Lord. That's how we're told to do it. God has given us a correlation between the family and the church. These passages remind us, just as we're supposed to sacrifice and love our families unconditionally, so we are to love the church of Jesus Christ and those who are in the church unconditionally. He took our family 
and placed it inside of another family called the church, the Christ Baptist Church family. Our family in Christ Baptist Church family, the same things we do in our family, we're to do at the, the larger family. Our family members are not perfect, neither is Christ Baptist Church. And neither are the members of the church. We are to find our joy in serving both our families and serving the church. Second thing is, we also learned that it's important to pray together as a family for the church. This is one of the, the most uh, abused privileges that we have as a church family. We've been called to pray. Men should always pray. God says in 2 Chronicles, Old Testament, uh, if my people were called by my name, but humble themselves and pray. Beloved, prayer is our dialogue. It's our communication with God. And as a church family, we're supposed to pray together. We should learn to pray for the leadership of the church in a number of ways. You should pray for their spiritual protection. You should pray for their protection from moral failure. And you say, well, my pastor wouldn't do that. Listen, pray that it does not happen. Pray for protection from moral failure. Pray for physical strength for your leaders. Pray for the preaching of the word. When's the last time you said, God, I'm going to church today. I'm going to be in worship today. And I want you to give a word, God, that's going to change my life. Pray for the preaching of the word. Pray for the courage of the leaders of your church. That they have a holy boldness to stand up for Christ. Pray for the families of the leaders of the church. Pray that your leaders will have discernment. That is, a righteous judgment of the things of God. Pray that they'll feel encouraged and not beat down and beat up. Pray for their wisdom, that they'll know how to take knowledge and properly apply it. We're to pray together in the family of the church. And part of the honor of being a church member is the opportunity to teach our family not only to love Christ, but to love his church. We're to love the members that are part of the church. Are all the children in the family great? Nah. In fact... Go back. You were not that great of a kid yourself. And so because of your own history, your own past, yet your family still loved you. We are to love even the unruly. We're to love the unlikable. We're to love the quiet ones. See, we have a tendency to love those who are open and out and boisterous and jumping around and shouting. But there's other folk that deserve attention because we love them just like Christ does. And that teaching often begins by praying together as a family for the church that God has placed us in. Thirdly, another critical element is we need to worship together as a family. And in worshiping together as a family, as a church member, we're responsible for encouraging one another, a parakaleo, come alongside, and, and leading our entire family to worshiping together in the church. As a married man, we should seek the, to include our spouse. If we are parents, we should seek to include our children. We are, we are to seek our family together in worship. And I realize once our children are grown and, and they're on their own and they have their own lives to live, if, if, if they, may, they may move to another area, but what is it about our family devotion in their growing up or lack thereof that is influencing the decisions they make when they get older, that they turn away, they walk away. What is it that you and I do or have done that does not draw them to the same Christ that we love? Many church members are single. In fact, the, the statistics are that two thirds of the people in every church are single. Many church members are single. They have no immediate family with whom they can worship in church. And, and that whole singles ministry thing doesn't work for some people, but they're still part of the body of Christ. How do we deal with them? How do we intermingle with them? How do we worship with them? Regardless, there are people who are watching us. There's still people who are watching them. There's still people who are watching us in our church as we show the love of Christ. They are to be example to other people. 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul said to Timothy, he says, Let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believer. We are to be examples to others of what it means to be a believer in Christ. And this worshiping situation is especially poignant when a church member uh, has somebody in their family who is not a Christian. You know that there's a sister in the church, her, her husband's not saved, there's a, there's a brother in the church, his wife's not saved, 
there's a, a person that comes to church, but their children and other family members are not saved. We should be aware of that. And, you know, being aware of it, we should find ways to interact with those persons in order to get a fellowship going with them. Paul even addressed the issue of divorce and separation in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There is no matter that is off the table when it comes to the church's involvement in people's lives. How we approach those matters is what really matters. And how we approach those situations is what has affected a lot of the young people, as we're going to see in a, in a video presentation of youth responding to the church. In essence, Paul instructed that the believing spouse should never take the initiative to leave the unbelieving spouse. Listen, both of y'all were out there partying, unsaved, drinking and drugging, and then one of her, let's say she got saved. She got saved, started coming to church. She shouldn't then get so spiritual, or he shouldn't get so spiritual after he found, the Lord found him, that you're going to leave the other person behind because you're not saved. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 13, because the believing spouse, you stay there because you serve as a testimony of who Christ is to your spouse. You don't walk away from it. And so there are things that are addressed as the family worships together. And here it is. What if that other family member... The one that's not saved, don't go to church. You, you can go back home and you can give them the sermon of the day, not with words, but with your life. You can go back home and live out those things. Or you can, you can look at circumstances. You may be watching television together. And some of the very things that were taught Sunday, you can say, hey, look at that. Look at the Waltons. Look, look, at, what the, look at what this family is doing. You can bring those things out as lessons and discuss it and find out where things are. There are ways to approach teaching the message and worshiping with your family even when they're unsaved. Fourth thing, you, you got to fall deeply in love with the bride of Christ. The church is his bride. You don't just attend church. You're not just a part of church. That is the bride of Christ. And you need to love her just like Christ loves her. As church members, we're not merely to like our church, only serve. We're to fall deeply in love with our church. We ought to have a love, unconditional love passion for doing the work of Christ. Christ the bridegroom. The church is his bride. Our commitment to loving the bride of Christ should be with an unwavering and unconditional love. An unconditional love, let's be honest, is not easy. It's not easy loving everybody the same, but we are called to love them. Which if someone is perfect and meets all of our, our, our perceived needs, oh, it's easy to love that person. But when they don't meet our perceived needs and they don't give us the accolades we think and they don't uphold us, listen, you love them with a love. I love what Jesus did even as he was hanging on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Such love is one way. When you only think about what you can get out of it, what you're going to enjoy from it. When it's all about me, my needs, that is not unconditional love. Unconditional love means my love for the church will grow. Even as I may disagree with somebody, even as we don't always have the same thought in mind, we can have a unity of purpose that we're going to, God's going to be glorified to what we're doing. And as we grow more deeply in love with our church, we will do all that we can in God's power to bring our families with us. It may not be your children, it may be grown, but you got a cousin somewhere, you got an auntie somewhere, you got an uncle over there, you know Uncle Bobo. Uncle Bobo ain't never been to church, but you gotta draw Uncle Bobo. You gotta do whatever you can to get him to come with you. We'll pray together, we're going to worship together, and we're gonna to serve together because we love the bride of Christ. We're gonna to go to the video, and we're gonna examine some things that young people have to say about some of the stuff I just brought forth. And as we're examining these things, let your hearts and minds be attentive to knowing that there's a way that we can be a healthy church, praying, worshiping, committed, loving Christ's bride. Let's go to the video. Yes, I do believe that there is um, a decline in black millennials like attending the building and honestly not even just the building but even staying within God's church like actually leaving the faith I feel like a mm -hmm. lot of 
black millennials may be leaving the church um, because they feel like, it's kind of like if you decide not to go to your grandma's house no mm -hmm. more for Thanksgiving, you kind of just drifted right. away a little bit. You're just like, yeah. oh, I'm gonna do it. And then you start seeing the hypocrisy, but yet it's not just grandma's house though, it's because now you, you're going to the church on Sunday, but you got people now wanting to make you change your life, or they're being judgmental. Is now it's just like, mm -hmm. I, this isn't really serious anyway. Mm -hmm. They're not being taught. And then we go back to the lack of discipleship. Yeah, it's just about how loud can we be with our drums and who's the best singer <laughs> in the choir, who can play Man, this the best. Exactly. Like who it's a big family them? function, and I'm Man, like, I, I don't that. blame you for leaving because right. your foundation wasn't was rooted right. in right. Jesus. Right. And sometimes, and that's like. Like going back to his point, like when you experience like judgment from those people and, and you experience like, you know, like constantly being told something like, dang, like this person always got something to say about my hair. She right. always got something to say about what I'm wearing. She always got something. And it's like, right. then it goes to just, I'm not trying to go and be in that negative space and then call it church. If that was constantly being done to me and I wasn't rooted in Christ, I'd be gone. I would like, be out of here. Y'all not going to right. talk to me like sometime way every Sunday on the, no, right. you had mentioned it earlier, like correcting people on that because it's like your focus is not supposed to be on what it, what I look like. It's not supposed to be on what I'm wearing. It's not supposed to, all you, you're not supposed to care about that at all. My take on it was when I was, you know, uh, going to school, I went to college in prison. I did 12 years in prison. Mm -hmm. So uh, representing Christ in prison in such a racial environment, mm -hmm. it, it, it gave it gave flavor to what persecution really was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Me, I, I've seen brothers die for Christ on the prison yard. You know what I mean? I was persecuted for Christ, for wow. stop gang banging except Christ. But it was Mexicans, whites, blacks, and we was worshiping the Lord under, under threat that mm -hmm. if y'all go do this, we gonna get y'all fouled. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when it came to color, the Lord told me a, a long time ago, you're not a black Christian, you're a Christian with black. There you, you go. Know. You know what I mean? And when I wrap my mind around that, then I started to live it out. Yeah. My yeah. Christianity became way more easier. Yeah. The, the church in its leadership, or whatever you want to call it, it hasn't matured. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To where it can, it can, it can get on the the grassroots level of millennials and, and get at us where we at. Like you said, sir, Victory Outreach is a very big, big, big conglomeration. Mm -hmm. But their uh, uh, meat and butter is individuals who are coming out of something. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, gang banging and, and prostitution mm -hmm. and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But what yeah. about the people who are not That's part of that? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, yeah. they haven't figured that out. They ain't matured to where they can, they can, they can do. Like, what you're saying is that, uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I want to show the whiteboard. Right? <laughs> okay, interesting dialogue. And uh, you say, I don't agree, I do agree. Listen, the issue in, in dealing with this and hearing from what millennials are thinking is not whether you and I agree, it is what matter of instruction from scripture is going to guide us and how are we going to fix it and serve it up where they can receive what we're saying and there's, there's two very key things to the serving up one of them has to do with how you're preparing the meal uh, I, I used to watch growing up there was Popeye and he used to just pop the spinach right out the can and, and it didn't taste that well and then somebody else took spinach and cooked it in a different kind of way, and spinach tastes a lot better. Beloved, it's how you cook it up. Second thing is the vessel that you're serving it out of. What does the vessel look like? If the vessel is an acceptable vessel, anybody who uh, takes the spinach and puts it in a shovel and brings it and tries and shove it into somebody's mouth is not going to work. But you put it into a nice dish. And, and the aroma and things are there, it becomes favorable. So let's, let's examine some of the things that these young people say. And it helps us to understand, or at least navigate through the difficulty of relating to the younger generation that we want to be a part of our healthy church. One of the young people said, there's a decline in black millennials, like attending the building. And honestly, not just staying in the building, but within God's church. Actually, they're leaving the faith. Beloved, there's something to what was said there. You need to understand 
And, and, and for years, we've hung our hats on Proverbs 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up, chanach. Train up a child in the way in which he should go. Chanach means to dedicate or to consecrate stemming from a root meaning the roof of the mouth or the lower part of the mouth it, it, it is a it is a, a a root the chanak the root of the word stems from something that is essential to help us understand what it means to train up midwives used to create a sucking sensation in newborn babies by crushing the dates and the bitterness of the dates would cause the baby to start a sucking sensation as the mother was breastfeeding the baby that, that, that are we, in fact, creating a sucking sensation? Are we creating a hunger, a desire for people to come to the Lord? This word is also used as a bit or a bridle that you put into a horse's mouth to point the horse in the direction that you want them to go. In fact, the horse's natural inclination is to run. Do we have the controls to put in place to control the natural energy of the horse where the horse knows to go when we say go and stop when we say stop the, the word means to create this hunger to create this sucking sensation it means to create a desire and a control in the lives of the child now we've been called to be salt and light and, and I, I think I may have shared a few weeks ago we used to say back you take a horse to work but you can't make him drink that's not true because horses cows, mules, donkeys, they have a, a love for salt. If they get near salt, they're going to lick it. They lick the salt, they're going to, they're going to drink water. So some of you won't know this, but that's the reason why when you go to bars, you don't know this, just listen. When you go to bars, they serve you peanuts and they serve you salty things at the bar because once they get the salt in you, you need something to drink to keep you drinking. If you and I are salt and light, we should create a thirst in the lives of those that are around us, that we're training up, that we're growing. That thirst will always bring them to a place where they'll come back to the spring, to the well of what God is providing to soothe their thirst. We always thought that as millennials grew older, at least some would return to some traditional religious life. A recent Pew research poll indicates that today's youth, younger generations, they may be leaving religion for good. There are some that have walked away completely from the church. And, and we need to go in and say, what can we do? Well, some things, we just need to continue to be salt and light, no matter what goes on. When the salt has lost its savor, the Bible says it's only beneficial to be trodden underfoot. Ye are the light of the world, Jesus declares. And as light, we all have a tendency to draw. Light is in, in the things leave darkness in order to come to light. I was in a, a few days ago, I had this fly that was in the house. And no matter what I tried, I couldn't get that fly. So what I did was when it got dark, I turned the light on on one little room, the little bathroom, and I left the light on. Well, it wasn't long before the fly found his way throughout the whole house. He found his way into that little bathroom. And when he got there, somebody was waiting for him. See, light draws. And we've got to be ready to know that we're to be salt and light. The key Hebrew word in the phrase is derek. Train up, train up, chanak, a child in the derek, in the way in which he should go. That's very clear. It's very important to understanding this. It, derek can refer to a literal road, or it can be uh, a, 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 the way something acts, the way, the manner in which something is. Proverbs 30, verse 18 and 19 says this. There are three things which are too wonderful for me. Four, which I do not understand. What don't you understand, Solomon? The way of an eagle in the sky. The way of a serpent on a rock. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And the way of a man with a maid. He says, three things, they're wonderful. And the fourth thing, I don't understand. I don't understand these things. Listen to what he, listen to what he really declares. What do the ways of an eagle in the sky, a snake on a rock, a ship in the ocean, and the way a young man handles or meets a young woman, what are the things that they have all, all have in common? That's, that's really what we want to get to. The, the, the way, the derrick, the manner. What are the things that they all have in common? 
Some writers say the ways of these four are mysterious and others say that they're non-traceable. That's what he's talking about. Others suggest that they're easily, uh, you can, they each, each easily masters an element that is seemingly difficult. That's, that's the implication. But one thing for certain, when you look at this, all four of these things, each one of these, there are no pathways, there are no prescribed pathways that any one of these go. The eagle, there's no flight plan. The, the, the serpent on the rock, you don't know how, which way he's going to go slither off the rock or slither up. You don't know. You don't know which way. The ship may have a destination it's headed for. There's a lighthouse, but it doesn't know what storm it's going to run into. Well, who knows that way? And, and God, the last one, who knows how a young man is going to act around a young woman? You know, especially when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, and all you know is that you have might and strength, and, and you're going to hit her, and you, that's the only way you know to show that you can play and, and be playful. And not intellectually, uh, not, not, not in, a, in, a, in a, a social kind of way. Who knows those ways? None of them have a prescribed course. There's no prescribed path. The way of a man with a maiden refers to a man's affectionate courting of a woman. And it matters. There's something very key about this. The young man doesn't know it. He doesn't know it until he's later on in life. If you observe the things that she has an interest in, then those are the things that you would do to have some kind of social uh, connection with her. In each of these, the term way refers to a characteristic, a, a manner of which things are done. Train, so here it is. Train a chanak, a child, in the way, the derek, the characteristic manner that is applicable to that child. You won't try and train and, and, and direct an eagle the same way you would a snake on a rock. You won't try and direct a, a ship in the middle of the sea the same way you direct a young man to find a maiden. Each one has its own characteristic manner that you have to deal with. We're to train a child according to his or her characteristics or manner or bit that God has placed in them. The creator, he gave to every one of us our own separate bent. Some are going to be artistic. Some are going to be athletic. Some are going to be academic, and according to the bent that God has placed in us, we train them up according to the bent. Now, this is really good because even strong-willed children, uh, uh, even those who are compliant, even those who are quiet, even those who are noisy, there's a way that they have about them. There's a manner that they have about them. One could be encouraged by re rewards or recognition for the things that they've done while the other couldn't care less if you gave them a dollar for dancing. They don't care. You've got to know what is the manner in which they are. Training up calls for a relationship. You've got to know as a parent, as a church school teacher, the gross error to make is, I love all my children the same. I love all my students the same. Beloved, they don't, they're not all made the same. They all have their own bent. And so we need to study them understand them and dedicate ourselves to understanding how can we get them to enjoy our shared purpose i gotta find out and so train up a child in the way in which you would go sometimes we don't succeed at that we don't know the way we don't observe the way another one of the young people said when you start to see the hypocrisy and some people want to make you change your life aren't, aren't they being judgmental that's one of the things that millennials, Gen Z, they, they feel that we are attacking, that we are not loving, and we're just being judgmental. We're talking about their clothes, we're talking about how they dress, we're talking about how they talk, and we're just being judgmental against them. Uh, that, let's, let's just examine something that may be helpful for us in dealing with them. There was another Pew Research study that said, many millennials have strong ties to religion to begin with, uh, uh, many religions never had strong ties, excuse me, never had strong ties to begin with, which means that they were less likely to develop the habits or associations that make it easier to return to a religious community. Remember, train them up in the way we should go when they're old, they should not depart, they should come back to it. Some of them never had the depth of relationship in the first place. So therefore, departing and staying away is a lot easier to do. The study also noted that changing views about the relationship between morality and religion also appear to have convinced many young parents that religious institutions are not relevant. 
and unnecessary for their children. So it's, it's the way these millennials, Gen Z, feel, but then there was something that the parent also felt. There was a liberty that their parents also felt, that the busters, that their parents also had a drawing back, or I have my own opinion about. And this only caused them to be more opinionated themselves according to their own mandates, according to what they feel, according to their own conversations. The research pointed out that millennials may be the symbols of a broader societal shift away from religion, but they didn't start it on their own. Now, we can't hold them totally responsible. Their parents were at least partly responsible for a widening generational gap in religious identity and beliefs. They were more likely than previous generations to raise their children without any connections to organized religion. Look, when I grew up, I grew up in church all my life, and uh, I, re I recall doing a workshop with my youngest son on one occasion. He told that in the, in the, in the presentation, it was a father and son presentation, he said, we used to go to afternoon sun services 54 weeks a year. That's a, that's a very telling statement. 54 weeks a year, we went to afternoon service. We'd go to church in the morning, and, and, and afternoon service somewhere, and then there was a group I was singing in, we were someplace singing. And so all they knew was church. Now you say, that's a good thing. You brought them up in church, and look at them now, they're still in church. Yeah, yeah, it, it, may, it, it worked out. It worked out. However, what we need to understand is that just forcing that diet upon them is not a way to think, we can think that we're going to draw them to a relationship with Christ. And so we need to learn some things. We, we, so, so what we notice is that when that generation came along, they decided they were not going to go to afternoon services 54 weeks a year. In fact, they're not going to go to church every Sunday. In fact, my whole set of rules about church is going to be different. And as these changes, these shifts, these, these morphings occur, things are different. Tied to the young person's observation was the presence of hypocrisy in the church. So you're making me go to church. And then children know a lot more than we give them credit for knowing. We think that we're hiding things from them. They observe things and they notice how, how certain relationships are developed. Who hates who? Who talks about who? Who doesn't like who? They, they notice these things. They notice, I got the love of Jesus in my heart, and then you hate this person and you hate the other one. You don't like that. You talk about them. Children notice that. And so they notice the hypocrisy. And, and that is akin to saying one thing and doing another thing. Mark chapter 7, verse 6, 8. Jesus says, This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching us doctrine, human precepts. We're saying one thing with our lips. The problem is, the lips only speak what the heart have in them. So when I speak hate, when I speak bitterness, when I speak division, that's what's in my heart. And when I speak that out of my heart, and my children are seeing it, I'm a leader in the church, and they see the hypocrisy of me saying one thing and doing another thing, it creates a distance between them and the God that you're trying to get them to see. Jesus was calling these people hypocrites. He was reciting Isaiah 29:13. And to counter this hypocrisy, there is a remedy. To counter it, all you have to do, the one who would worship him must be classified as holy because they truly embrace the divine will in their lives. Jesus says, you say one thing with your lips, but your heart is far from me. If we start to live a holy life, we'll embrace God's will. We'll live out God's will through our living. Secondly, to counter this hypocrisy, the honor of which they would give to him with their lips must flow from a heart that is full of faith and love. He only wants a pure worship, a pure honor. And as that pure honor comes before him, Jesus says, you won't be like those hypocrites who worship me with your lips, but whose heart's far from me. In general, people tend to react more strongly to hypocrisy when it includes criticism or negative judgment. One thing to be a hypocrite, but then to negatively judge somebody else, to 
talk negative and be judgmental about somebody else. You're telling me about coming to church and how I dress, and yet you're being negative against other people and other things of God. That hypocrisy is driving them away. It's putting them to another place. People are far quicker to notice and call out hypocrisy when it goes against their own beliefs. So these young people have developed their own beliefs. They have their own thoughts. And they're seeing how the church is. And they're saying, you know what? I don't want to be a part of that. Basically, people are not 100% rational or consistent. Value judgments are not static. Are typically more subjective than the, are simple more subjective rather than objective. We have subjective values that we come up with. Another one of the young people said this. When you're not being taught, it is a lack of discipleship coupled with a high focus on the music and the singers without any foundation. When you and I were growing up, the choir was all we had. The usher board, working in church, BTU, all of those fellowships and gatherings and retreats. That's what we had. And we thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And now we're trying to make that to be the same thing, the same panacea for this generation. Uh, we, we, we're part of a group that owns a campground down in South of, by Millville. And uh, the, the, we had a camp director who wanted people to come to that camp. You had to give up your cell phone. You could not play games. And you had to come there and walk through the woods, collect bugs, and fish. Well, I'm sorry. I got my Madden at home. I got my Sega at home. I got my PlayStation at home. I got air conditioning at home. I got my cell phone at home. And you're going to tell me that if, unless I come and do exactly what you want. So it got to a place where a lot of kids didn't want to go to the camp anymore. Because we were trying to drive an old paradigm into a new generation. We've got to learn how to make adjustments, to make to adaptations. They said, all this idea with the music and the singing, that's wonderful. I love to praise him. But it's without foundation. This generation wants to be taught. Listen, we live in a world and society that's dominated by technology. The internet makes it possible for factual knowledge to be accessed anywhere. Sitting in church, you get in there and you make a statement, they can Google it on their phone and see if you're telling the truth. It's not solely undisputed information, though, that millennials are looking for. Millennials and Gen Z, they're not just wanting information. They want relational instruction. They want someone to teach them, to talk to them, whom they respect. Your title does not give you the privilege to tell them. They need to have their respect for you on the basis of a life that is lived that is pleasing to God. When they see that life that is pleasing to God, then they can accept the dialogue that you're willing to give. They want relational instruction. And many times we think that they just need to listen to us. I'm the teacher. They should listen to what I have to say. These two subgroups, they're really driven by activism. Being born at a time when things have been really rough and, and even pointing to hopelessness. Many, there are many young people that came through these two generations that are hopeless. And, and some are coming out right now. Praise God for it. This youthful generation, they want to take action against skepticism, having a critical gaze towards the changing the status quo. Just the way that's the way things were does not mean that's the way they have to be for us. Wait a minute. We've been in this thing for a long time now. We've been doing this religion thing for a long time. Give me that old time religion. Beloved, make it fresh. Allow it to be alive. Allow it to live in the age in which we're living. And so they're simply saying, we're not going to stand for the status quo. They're activists. What are we going to do about it? Young people said, another one of them said, there's a sense that constantly being told about the same thing is judging. That amounts to being in a negative space and calling it church. For those who are not rooted in Christ, they're gone. You find yourself constantly, no, no. Are you still pounding the gavel? No. You can't say that. You can't do that. You can't look like that. You can't wear your hair like that. You can't. No. Beloved. That kind of judging drives them away. Does not grow. Well, if they want to go, let them go because remember, you train them up in the way in which they'll go. When they get older, they're going to come back. Not happening. And so we're trying to have a healthy church 
coming together to worship and praying and gathering and loving the bride of Christ, we've got to make sure we're not being judgmental. Just a few more thoughts they share every done. One of them said, it helps to recognize that they are not black Christians, they are Christians that are black. A lot of the racial situations are turned off. We've got to make sure, and, and unfortunately, the church is probably the most segregated place in America. Um, we've got to get to a place where we can come together and stop being so black. I mean, I, 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 people misinterpret, misunderstand this whole idea. There's no way that Jesus can be a black man. Because if he was, how can you be, I mean, be a white man? How can you be a white man and live in Egypt and hide out as a child? How can you be a white man and have hair like lambs, little feet like polished bread? Beloved, we got to get off of this color thing. It's not just uh, white people that have a color problem. We all got to get past the color issues. The lights versus the darks and the brights versus the not so brights. We've got to get off the color thing. Because these young people are not putting up with it. They, they hate racism. They hate being judgmentalism. They hate these ideas that you talk about the love of Christ and the things you're doing does not look like Jesus at all. So a lot of the racial situations is it was a turn off. Another of them said the church and its leadership has not matured to the place where it can get, up, get on the grassroots level of the youth. Grassroots. Get down to where they are. I, I know how high we are. I know how lofty we are. We're all the way up here. We're climbing up Jacob's ladder. We're all, we're, we're, look, at, look at how high we are. And yet, why can't we get down to the grass roots of where they are? That's what they want. They want to just be real people. They want to be normal. They want to just be so, so lofty and so mighty. The church is not mature. They're saying that what we call maturity is really immaturity. Finally, there's a problem with the meat and butter of the church in dealing with someone who's coming out of something. We love to embrace the gangbangers. We love to embrace the, the prostitutes and the people with deep problems. We love them. But all of our young people don't have problems. All of our young people are not gangbangers. Are we addressing them with the same love and adoring fellowship that we're giving to people who are coming out of the world? I will lead my family to be a healthy church member. Because of my relationship with Christ, I want my children to enjoy the same thing. One of my boys lives in Florida, and I remember when he came to me to tell me at age 18, he says, Dad, I'm no longer gonna play for your church. I'm gonna be playing for a church in Plainfield, New Jersey. God bless you, son. I thank God for the gift that he's given you. Move on, life is there. Still my son, I still love him. He worships down there in Florida now. My other son goes to a church right here in Marstown. He just joined there a few months ago. And they're both still working in church. They're both still giving their life to Christ. They both needed the liberty to exercise the freedom to worship God in a way that will please God according to his mandates in the word and live within the age of where they live. Now they're raising their own children. And many of the same things that, that they learned growing up, they're, they're applying to their own families now. But I thank God. I thank God for the foundational foothold that they were given as children. We've got to be careful. We're not driving our millennials away, but we're doing everything possible that they can see Christ in us and have a relational atmosphere that they can bring their friends to, that their friends are not going to feel judged, they're not going to feel put out, put off because they don't meet the standards of our church. We've got to open our hearts in a big way. We've got to open our hearts and not just appeal to those who have means. We've got to open our hearts to people who have no means. The people who don't dress like we do. They don't have the, the resources that we have. But then they don't have the love of Christ that we have that we can give to them. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you, Lord for our gathering today. And we thank you, Father, that in our study of desiring to be a healthy church, one that honors you. We pray, Lord, we can learn, grow, develop, alter our thinking in order that we can reach some of these Gen Z, these millennials, these young people who are the church right now. And God, if we can't reach them, somebody's going to. I pray that we're given the tools. I pray that we're given the, the, the insight on how to reach out. 
I thank you, God, for allowing us to come together in this study. And I ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. I want to remind you that a copy of this lesson will be available online. Just go up, click the Bible study for this lesson. Uh, lesson 5 PDF is there. Thank you for joining in with us. You desire to give a donation to this ministry. We appreciate your giving. We appreciate your love that you show to us. Thank you for joining in with us. We have uh, one or two more lessons with this study. Then we're going to be moving to another study. Thank you. Praise God for you. Be blessed. Have a good night. Thank you for sharing today at the Open Church, Open Bible Ministry at the Christ Baptist Church. If this lesson has been a blessing to you and you desire to support Christ Baptist, please go to www.cbcburlingtonnj.org. Click on the Give tab at the top of the page and follow the prompts. Or you can send your donations by mail to Christ Baptist Church, P.O. Box 10, Burlington, New Jersey, 08016. A printed copy of this lesson can be obtained by going to the CBC website listed above and clicking on the online Bible study tab. A PDF will be available for downloading according to lesson date. Christ Baptist can be contacted using the information listed at the bottom of the page.